Welcome, fans, to another off-season episode of Rangers Ed. This is your host, Cousin Ed. I'm here with my co-host, Coach Ed, over there in his Ranger room. What's up, Coach? What's going on? Sporting the NHL coolest game on earth shirt that uh, I don't know who got it for me for Father's Day. I know Eddie presented it to me, which is from you, Ed. Us. Podcast. It was, a it, was the pod. it was from the podcast? Okay, thank you, fellas. You're yeah, welcome. so you – YouTube listen or YouTube watchers can see it, but uh, if you guys are listening, it's a baseball. I guess it's like a baseball jersey, like a mesh baseball jersey with the NHL logo on the on the chest, right? The old one. Coolest yeah. game on earth on the sleeve. Pretty dope. Nice eBay yeah. find by the, from the boys. And that's Little Ed you're hearing over there in his Ranger room. Got the shanky yep. golf hat on. What's up, Little Ed? Yeah, we all got some new attire on today. I got the Shanky Golf. Uh, I, I think we forgot to shout them out last episode. I've been wearing the hat on the course. It's great. It's got a nice skull and uh, cross golf clubs logo, and I love their stuff. So head on over to Shanky Golf and use promo code EDPOD. That's it, EDPOD, <laughs> for, uh, for 15% off. ShankyGolf.com. And we got Mikey Producies over there. What's up, Mikey? What's up, fellas? How's everyone doing? Good. I'm glad you put a shirt on for us. Appreciate that. <laughs> Anything. For I feel you. like we feel like we haven't spoken in a while, but it's only been a week. I know it feels like that. A lot's been going on. We had the NHL draft uh, yesterday and today. For some reason, on a Wednesday, every other league has that their drafts on like a Friday night on prime time or Thursday night, but the NHL decided to do it on a Wednesday. Um, so that concluded today. We'll talk about that. And uh, free agency hits uh, Saturday. So a couple things we're going to preview, where the Rangers are at, who they took, and what's going on uh, heading into the offseason. Yeah, looking forward to a lot of action. I mean, uh, yeah, I guess let's just jump right into it. Um, yeah, I've been getting hit with a lot of questions on Instagram. So instead of uh, typing them out to you, I figured we'd just address – the questions I've been getting uh, here on the episode and give our fans a little shout out. So turns out that the fan or the questions I've been getting kind of lines up with the topics we had in store for you guys tonight or this morning, whenever you're listening to this. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, the first one, cuz which one you want to get into first? Let's start with the draft. I think uh, any questions on the draft? Let's go there. Yeah, I mean, the one question I got from John Scherzinger, we, uh, we might as well start it off by talking about uh, the number, what, 23 overall pick, right? Yes, sir. Gabriel Perot, uh, John Scherzinger wanted to know from Coach Ed if he is related to Jabert Perot. Um, I just know that his father was the ex-NHL player Yannick Perot. Can they be related in some degree? Possibly, not that I know of. They're not related. I didn't, they are definitely <laughs> not related. Definitely not related. I confirmed. Awesome. Okay, so there you go. So, All right, John. Well, thanks for your question. But now uh, let's move into talking about the pick itself. Yeah, so Gabe Perot drafted 23rd overall by the Rangers. He was ranked top 15 by most scouting uh, you know, services that I saw. Bob McKenzie, a bunch of others. They had him in around top 15. Uh, so he ended up falling to 23rd. He's a, a smallish winger, 5'11", uh, uh, 165 pounds, but he's got a ton of offensive skill. He actually broke Austin Matthews' uh, record for most points in the U.S. National Development Program. So congrats to him I on that. That's that. Yeah, I mean, th this U.S. National Program is really pumping out some really good NHL players, so I got some hopes that Perot will be another of those. Um Really a good like, value pick in that spot. Even like you know? Jack Hughes just came through there and everything. So it's like it's pretty shocking that he led or broke that record and still went 23rd overall. Yeah, I saw the um I saw the the stats for the US National Development Program in the record book for most points in a season. Um so here here's the the list. Gabe Perot this season, 132 points. Will Smith also this season, drafted fourth overall by San Jose, 127 points. After that, Austin Matthews, 117. Jack Hughes, Jack Hughes, Clayton Keller, uh, some guy Cole Iserman this year. 
Patrick Kane, Cole Caulfield, Phil Kessel, Matthew Kachuk. I mean, these are really good NHL players. So if he uh, ends up in the realm of any of those players, I would be very happy. Yeah, I'd say. So I mean, I'm wondering why he did. Why do you think he did drop down? I think it's his physical stature. The the other two guys on his line are more uh, physically ready, if you want to say. Maybe that's why they went higher in the draft. They're ready, NHL ready, possibly. Yeah, I think the knock on Perot is his size and skating. Um, he's he's billed as a really intelligent player. Um, I read a few scouting reports on him. I haven't really seen him play, obviously, but. Um, the reports on him just sir he's kind of like adam fox at forward right so his physical tools are not really um you know gonna wow you but he makes the right play he's in the right position he, he's crafty with the puck you know a good good stick handler good passer and a finisher so he's got all the skills but it's more he more so relies on his brain than his raw physical tools so i think in the draft guys like that typically will fall because everyone gets wowed in by a six five guy or someone that they think will develop over time, right? Like a Keandre Miller type prospect. Versus... As Brian Boucher, as Brian Boucher would say, he's, this guy's got muscles in his face. <laughs> exactly. So, so look, we're not going to be wowed by his physical tools, but hopefully he can, you know, be the Adam Fox at right wing. Uh, we are a little short at right wing depth, so. Can't hurt to add a, a guy into the system like that. He's going to go to Boston College with his line mates. Also with uh, our third round pick, Drew Fortescue, who uh, this guy left. Is he the- related to Fortescue Avenue in Oceanside? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he took him 90th overall, 6'2", 176 pound defenseman from Pearl River, New York, a local kid, uh, grew up an Islanders fan. When asked uh, if he was still an Islanders fan, he said, no, he's now a Rangers fan. So I guess that's the only way I would ever become an Islanders fan if I were drafted by the Islanders. I mean, so, we might wait. have to ask our buddy Shawnee, but even if you grow up an Islanders fan, if you get drafted by the Rangers, I mean, come on, isn't that a better path? You got to think a little bit. Yeah. Class, I mean, a, okay. class a organization. I mean, the Islanders, yeah. Wait, did Emily Kaplan ask him that question? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Probably. She was terrible, dude. Thank God oh, I missed she, that. She is really bad, Emily Kaplan. That might have to be um, our broadcast banter. Might have to no, cut I, this in case we want to get her on the pod. No, <laughs> no that's all right. <laughs> no, thanks. Um, I'll pass on that one. But yeah, I, I thought. You know, Ow! He <laughs> Can someone explain what just happened, Coach? He uh, just drove his nail. Prusty just drove his nail into my foot. <laughs> Coach's cat is scratching him during the podcast, and he's yelling. After what? A mo- almost two months of taking care of him with his infected eye. That really scared me. That was so funny. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So, anyway, um, also going to Boston College who's really set up, they're going to have some really big name prospects coming in. Ryan Leonard went to Washington first round. He's coming in. Will Smith, Gabe Perot, uh, Fortescue, and also Jacob Fowler, who went to uh, the Canadians in net. So they got a ton of guys. They're going to be a team to watch in college hockey if you're into that. Um, And then also sticking with the theme of big players, uh, Rasmus Sandin. Sorry, Jesus, Rasmus Sandin is an NHL player already. Rasmus Larson, uh, taken in the fifth round, uh, took him with the pick we got from Edmonton for Jaden Grubb. He's another big kid, 6'3", 201 pounds, defenseman. Uh, Six-round picks. I'm going to try this one. Dylan Rubroic, 6'7". 205, 18-year-old, uh, and Ty Henricks, not Hendricks, Henricks, 6'5", 205. If he makes it, I can already see Ham, uh, Sam clarifying that it's Henricks and not Hendricks. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so took a lot of big guys in the later rounds. I mean, you guys think that was by design? 
I would say so. I think the NHL is uh, a little bit of a copycat league. I think uh, everyone saw how Vegas dominated and, and phys- both physically. And I guess like they also got a little lucky with in- non-injuries. And I think that has a lot to do with physical stature as well. So I don't know. Like I said, I think it's a copycat league. So a lot of teams are going are going for size, especially on the back end. Yeah, I think you see all that around the around the league, coach. You saw what Arizona did. I think every guy what they took that? was over six five or something. Oh like yeah, that. wow. Well, you notice in the third, fourth, fourth and fifth rounds, I was watching the before we came on. I know what happened today. I know what happened today, but those guys are all like, let's just say, normal size. They were in the five nine to five eleven range, so all the monsters kind of went in the early. first round and a half. Generally. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I mean, I'll go, I'll go back to the old story that someone told us. I forget where it was. Me and Pop were somewhere at a tournament, and this guy said in Canada, they basically line up the plays at tryouts, which they did in the 90s, let's say. I don't know if they still do it. And basically they'll say anybody, they line them up in size order, and they'll cut off the line. And they'll go, you guys go to this side, and you guys go to this side. And those smaller kids aren't ready yet, unless they're like a Wayne Gretzky type, obviously. But generally, they just size them up. Yeah, that seems like a mistake. But I can understand in the late <laughs> – it does. I mean, there's plenty of that, I heard that from players. somebody. I don't remember the, the source. That sounds credible. But um... – <laughs> so in the in the later rounds – Well, I didn't make – I can... <laughs> In the later rounds, for sure, I can see, uh, you know, the, the desire to take guys that are big. Like, look, Dylan Rubroic, right? I don't know anything about this guy. Oshawa Generals, OHL, 18 years old, six foot seven center. Like, if you're going to take a project in the sixth round of the draft, right, a guy who's unlikely to make the NHL anyway, might as well be a six seven guy. I don't see the harm in doing that. I can see the logic behind just, uh, you know, going big at the end of the draft specifically. Um. You know, and they didn't do that in the first round. They took Gabe Perot, the best prospect available at the time of their pick. So it seems like the theme is early on, take the best guy available. And as the draft goes on, they identify certain traits that they want, particularly size on the back end and up the middle, and and they stuck to it. So we'll see how these kids develop. None of them are going to be on the team this year. None of them are going to even sign a contract, at least until next year or so. We just got to follow their development. It might be fun to watch some Boston College games this year. It looks like they're going to be fun to watch. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. I have a question. What is the USA National Team Development Program? What? Who do they play? Like that team. <laughs> um, I'm I saying mean, they, the team got 113 points or whatever it was, 137, whatever number. Who do they actually play? They play a Canadian team. They play European teams. What, what's the, you know, I, I never learned that schedule. I know this team yes. existed for 20 something years. Yeah. So they play, uh, for example, here, look at their schedule. The Johnstown Tomahawks. Uh, the the Muskegon Lumberjacks, the Maine Nordiques, so they're they're part of a league. Um, they're just, I guess, a collection of the the best kids in in the U.S. under eighteen, right? And they're playing um, so they're, uh, in a ju- it's a junior league. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot of teams in the league, so if you look it up, uh, league. So the development where team are most of the teams from. I'll tell you right now. They're placed in in Michigan. Um, I don't know, Mikey. Look that up because I'm not entirely sure. I know they play at the Under 18 Championship and the Holinka Gretzky Cup, but I think they're in, they're part of the USHL. I think I don't remember the exact name of the league. And then they just take all the best players from that league and make them put them on the national team development program. I think that's how it works. It's a good question, though, Coach. I wish I knew the exact answer. I probably should. So that that team represents the U.S. in the World Juniors. That's the team. The yeah. under eighteen, under seventeen. Yeah, they represent the U.S. Exactly. Okay. But that's not who they play during the season. 
obviously. They're not just playing like Sweden or anything like that. They, they're right. part of a – there's like a tournament and part of a schedule they play in. So but when they play teams – development program than it is – it's more so focused on developing their skills and their strength and getting them NHL ready and college ready more so than playing the games. Right. That's the idea. So they're all playing on separate junior teams and then they come together for the tournament play. Yeah. No, they're in a league. Eddie's saying. No, they all play in a league. The players it's- separately play in a league together. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> No, I think so. But if you look at their schedule, right? I'm looking at I'm looking at it right now. The under 18 team. They played, for example, last year, November 4, they played against the Youngstown Phantoms. Then they played November 8th against Chechia. Then they played 10 days later against Niagara University. So like they're playing foreign countries and junior teams so- and they they're just uh, there's a cockamamie schedule. Very random, game. so they just play very good teams. And they, yeah, yeah, and they so don't not... play every two days or something like that. Like it's more of a development program than it is an actual season. They do play a lot of games though. In November, the under eighteen team played one, two, three, four. Oh, they played seven games in the whole month of November. It's not that many, right? I mean, it's 30 days in November, right? Yes, yeah, so like April. weekend games. Right. So it, they're developing their skills and their strength, and they're getting ready to go to college and play professional hockey, and it's been successful. The process has worked. I think they – Coach, didn't you say you went to a coaching thing and they, they were modeling a lot of their development programs after, like, Sweden? Was it? Was yes. it, I wrong about that? So I no, think they do something true. similar – I think they do it similarly in Sweden leading into the SHL. I think they have a similar kind of development program and a junior league there. Very similar. You got to think those games they're playing. If if I'm playing against that team, I have a chip on my shoulder that I want to prove myself, you know, so they, they got to be some hard fought games. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And they're not playing, they're not setting these kids up to play against scrubs, you know, like these are really right, that's good what teams. I mean. They want the co- yeah, they want the competition. Yeah, definitely. like Niagara University is definitely a very good team. I mean, I'm sure that Tomahawk junior team is probably filled with a lot of talent and and kids that might be like like Coach Ed said, trying to make the US development program so they can get picked up at any point. So they're all playing their hearts out. Um, but yeah, to go back to like the coaching and like a lot of the things that they work on, because I went to one of the seminars as well, is like they they want to stress a lot of like small area games, they call it. <clears throat> so like tight areas, like dumping the puck into, into the corner and like doing one-on-one battles, two-on-two battles in a small area of the ice. So that's why you see, I mean, I hate to talk about it, but Jack Hughes is really good with the puck in, in small areas of the ice down low in the corners and things like that. So. He's just a good example of who, someone who went through the program. Austin Matthews as well. He's just a bigger body out there, but similar skill set. And, uh, yeah, I mean, like Cousin had said, it's obviously working. There's a lot of talent coming through the program, and especially Keandre Miller too. He's another product of the program as well, and you can see how much skill and talent he has. And one of the biggest things I talk about is his ability below the goal line as well in, in the defensive zone. So that definitely comes from all those, like, different drills that coach Ed and I have learned over the years. For sure. Yeah. It looks like they play a lot of games against college teams, too, which is interesting. So um, imagine being a college 20 year old playing against these 18 year olds. You probably like get out of here, dude. Like um, yeah. anyway, so, uh, you know, obviously only five picks for the Rangers in this draft. They traded their second round pick in the Patrick Kane deal. Um, small note, they did make a trade. They traded the 91st pick and a 2024 20, seventh to move up in the third round, one space to 90 to take Drew Fortescue. So I don't know why they did that. I guess maybe they thought Pittsburgh was going to take them. I don't know. Um, and one of their he six round Jerry picks, son. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I read that too. Go ahead, tell tell that story before we move on. Well, yeah, no, I was just reading, I guess. Uh, Drew and uh, Jerry's son go way back, so he must have texted Daddy and said, "Just, just you know, trade the picks and go get Drew." Yeah, 
so oh, Drew, he's friends with Drury's son. Drew right. also being the nickname of Drury, um, that was a little bit confusing, but Drew yeah. Fortescue, <laughs> Drew Fortescue played minor hockey with Chris Drury's son. They've known each other since they were 12 years old. So cool. You got to see him play a lot, so he knows what type of kid he is. So it could be a good thing. Yeah, well, there's always that connection with the Rangers, right? Um, Drury, yep. And the sixth round pick we got from Winnipeg, that was in the Andrew Cop deal. Um, that was a throw in back to us. So, um, yeah, five picks in the draft. We also had the NHL awards. Did anybody tune into that? I did can't not. say that I did. I did not either. I heard that there was, I mean, we should watch it, right? You're doing a podcast, but like it was a Monday night. You know, I mean, the league's got to do better at marketing this the league. Like, they just generally have to market the league better. I barely Plus, knew it was right. happening, and I'm on Instagram constantly. Like, I know. I know. I knew it was They're, coming. I knew it was coming up in Nashville because I think Dirk Bentley was going to be the live music or something. I saw on the on the country music station. He's hosting it. Yeah, he hosted it. Yeah, he. Ho- yeah, I saw it on the country music station advertised, not on NHL Network. And I knew it was coming up, but I didn't know when it was. Then they said it today. Jackie Redmond said, oh, last week was the awards thing in Nashville. It's been a hectic week. But she didn't I know. You know. I didn't know it was coming up. I know. So I saw I saw the results. I knew it was happening. But the league just, I don't know. They didn't do a great job marketing it. Um, but it is what it is. Uh, we obviously had Adam Fox. Uh, nominated for Norris Trophy. He ended up coming in second place to Eric Carlson, who is the first defenseman to score 100 points in, what, 30 years? Um, so, Little Ed, I'm going to go to you on the Eric Carlson Norris Trophy, his third Norris Trophy of his career. I mean, this this has to be like the <laughs> – like it has to be the year or whatever that they finally just give an award to the defenseman with the most points. I mean, it makes sense. You always have one every year, obviously. You give one to the forward with the most points pretty much. I mean, I guess the R. Ross is typically a forward, not the R. Ross, right? Um, no, the R. Ross is the player with the most points, yeah. Oh, okay. Which one's the – oh, that's the Ted Lindsay I'm thinking of, the voted one. But either way, it's typically given to a forward, obviously, and so you just ha- should have one for the defenseman. Then you don't have to worry about this every year. I mean, how do you give the best defenseman – award to a player with that had a minus 26 i know plus minus isn't the biggest stat in the world whatever blah blah blah, but like come on i gotta draw the line at like minus 15 i understand he's not on a good team but like he's good enough to score 100 points so like just play a little defense it's crazy to be minus 26 and score 100 points is he killing penalties no so that's what I'm saying. Like, why is he the best defensive in the league? Because he can score 100 points? I don't disagree, and it's not just because it was Adam Fox. I, I don't like that it's for the defenseman who scores the most points either. I agree. But, I mean, look, they the uh, AHL has a defensive defenseman award and an offensive defenseman award. That's how they, they roll. Ty Emerson, Rangers prospect for Hartford, actually won the Defensive Defenseman of the Year award for his uh, conference. So, yeah. you know, shout out to him. Maybe he'll be a Ranger soon. But, you know, the point is that makes more sense to me for sure. Uh, or at least, at least like the, because the point of the Norris Trophy isn't the best defensive defenseman either. It's not like you give it to Matthias Eckholm. <laughs> It's supposed to be the best all-around defenseman. That's what it's supposed to be. And Eric Carlson is not the best all-around defenseman. He's a hell of a player, and, and yeah, offensively gifted, but he's not the best all-around defenseman. I agree with that. But it gives a player like Lindholm a chance. If he has like a 50-point season, he has a chance of winning the award. You know what I'm saying? I just don't think they should have an NHL award for a guy that isn't like a star player. You know, it's like it's got to be a star player. So if you're going to do you should have an offensive defenseman of the year award and like an all around defenseman of the year award. You're not going to be like, all right, who's the best shot blocker? Give him an NHL award. You know, it's kind of. Yeah, I I can't disagree there, but I like it. Yeah, it just has to be more all around. So in my in my eyes, that's another win for Fox. 
he should have won. If we're if we're counting the Rangers Ed uh Norris trophy winners. He'll get another one in this year. He definitely will. It's just uh yeah, it's a shame that cuz he did finish with a lot of uh, first place votes. You could tell like I said there's definitely buzz around the league that they need another award. Um, there's some arguments that there's too many awards, but like, who cares? Just add one more award. And if they really, like you said, they could just market it. Why can't you market it as another award and like a good thing for the league? So, so what would you do? What would be your answer? You'd have like a defensive defenseman award. No, like you said, an overall defenseman or yeah, I mean, no, it's got to be overall because, like, a player like Fox could still score 90 to 100 points and still be killing penalties and, and doing more than just what Carlson does on the power play and whatnot, you know? like, Yep. Uh, doesn't even have to be 90 good. or 100 points. A guy who scores 60 to 70 points can come back to yeah. power play, can PK, and is solid defensively. That should Play be a ton of good. minutes. I mean, I don't know how many minutes Carlson was racking up, but, like – it, like I said, a minus 26 rating. I understand it's not an important, an important stat, but that just shows that he's not playing any defense whatsoever, especially if he's not even killing penalties, you know? So like, no, he didn't, um, he didn't kill penalties this year. I think he had like very few penalty killing minutes. Um, I, they're actually, I saw the stat and I can't remember it. I should have wrote it down because I know you would have loved it. When I saw it, I thought I mean, I, was like, oh, I gotta show this I mean, I don't want I don't want to say it's a simple solution, but they should have some kind of a, you know, with all the analytics today, they should have a formula based on minutes played, penalty kill minutes, power play minutes, power play points, and they should make some kind of a weighted formula where it makes sense because there's enough analytics that are done today that it should be a clear cut decision if you base it all on that. So there's no way a defenseman say that has 110 points or 105 points is a minus 26 doesn't kill penalties is only on the power play logs decent minutes compared to Fox's stats. There's no way Fox wouldn't win it. Dude. So Carlson has, is Carlson was a, I just look at this. He scored 101 points this year and only 27 on the power play, which means that he scored 74 points either Shorthanded, zero shorthanded. So all 74 even strength points and was a minus 26, which means he was on the ice for a hundred goals. For 100 goals. That's crazy. That is <laughs> there's no way he should be winning the Norris trophy. I'm sorry. That's a I, lot of goals, man. That's more than a goal a game. And he had uh 33 hits, which is a flawed stat, but still only 33 hits the whole season. How was he 90, the best defenseman in the league? And 90 block shots, which is about one a game. It's about I one mean, block He's shot a defenseman. You, you're going to get hit with the puck generally once. <laughs> oh, guess, guess how many giveaways he had in 82 games? 150. 101. I right, wasn't that giveaways. far off. It was yeah, over 150. 100. Jeez, that's a lot, though. Fox, by comparison – had only 74 giveaways. He also had 88 takeaways to go with those 74 giveaways. 125 block shots. So 35 more block shots. Also doesn't hit. But he was a plus 28. Uh, you know, and he also only had 29 points. I mean, look, he's on, that means he's on the ice for 30, 40 goals against the whole season, Fox. I mean, when you subtract his power play points from his point totals and then figure out plus 28 through the math, he had to have only well, That's what I'm saying. They can, they, can, around, you know? they can have some kind of a formula based on, like, say, five stats or, or whatever the number would be, the, what you would consider a defenseman being, you know, a very good player or top in the league. For you know sure. what I'm saying? I, that doesn't make sense to have a formula. I mean, make it simple. Don't make it like a, a human thing where I like, like say us arguing the four of us, you like an offensive defenseman. I don't. Eddie really doesn't. I don't know what Mike's theory <laughs> is on it, but so it's human error in the formula. That no, I agree. Well, that's the thing is it's voted, it's voted on by the writers. So like, 
<clears throat> everyone just based their voting on like, oh, this is the first time this has happened in what'd you say, thirty years or something? Yeah. So like that was what they're basing it off of. Like they have to acknowledge this milestone. Like, okay, so acknowledge it. Give the give the trophy to the guy with the most points as a defenseman. Done. Who's the last defenseman to get the hundred points? I think it was Brian Leach. And what was his? Mike, can you look up what Brian Leach's plus minus was when he had the hundred points last? The last player, just for argument's sake. And I don't think he won the Norris Trophy. Did he win it that year? I think he did. Yeah. Yes. Let's I see what so. his stats were. I can look it up. I think it was... that's what everyone's been talking about, but they don't bring up the stats, up, of course. I mean, when you win the Art Ross Trophy for the most points in the league, it's it's a cut and dry stat. It's not a human yeah. pick. So that's why that, it's very like simple solution. Saying, that, right. It, that should be the defenseman with the most points wins this. I award. mean, even didn't Call Yossi have the most or points? Or... Didn't Yossi yeah. have the most points and he didn't even win it? Cal McCarr yeah. beat Yossi even though Yossi had the most points. So, like, that just makes it – it's very inconsistent. And, and, I mean, Coach Ed brings up a great point where it's – the inconsistency comes with the, making it voted on by the writers. I mean – If Carlson did, had 98 it, points, Fox wins the Norris Trophy. Yeah, I don't want to talk about – right. Yeah. 100%. That's all it is. 101 points. Oh, my God. 100 points. I don't want to talk about the, every award, but did you see the, the asshole that voted McDavid fifth for the Hart Trophy? Yeah, you guys smoking crack. Like that, that just proves it right there that the system is flawed. Like what? I understand he's not unanimous, number one. Like you might have an argument for somebody else, but like to put him fifth? <laughs> and we know that guy – is the because he's the only person to not vote for McDavid to, first. Everybody else voted him first, right? Um, so the only other vote for first was David Pasternak. So you know it's like RA or something. <laughs> <laughs> or Jack some, Edwards, some Bruins fan or something. He's like, oh, I'm vote Pasternak. Give me a break, dude. Um, Leach was a anyway. uh, plus twenty five during that one hundred and two point season. And what year was that? 92, right? 91, 92. 91, 92. Right, he got hurt I mean, in 92, 92. There's your answer right there. You know what I'm saying? So the other awards, yeah. uh, McDavid won the Hart Trophy. Linus Solmark, Vezina, uh, he bombed in the playoffs. McDavid also won the Ted Lindsay Award. Matty Beniers in Seattle won the Calder. Jim Montgomery of Boston won the Jack Adams, Patrice Bergeron, the Selkie. Again, you might as well just rename that award at this point. Andre Kopitar, another Lady Bing for him. And then uh, the general manager of the year to Dallas is Jim Nill. And King Clancy, can't forget that. Mikhail Backlund, Masterton Trophy, Chris Letang, and Steven Stamkos takes home the Mark Messier Leadership Award. Um well earned for Steven Stamkos, I think, at this point in his career. He's a grizzled veteran. Um, he's, all right. You got any other questions from the fans? Yeah. Uh, next up, we're going to go with uh, this one sponsored by Bella Italia since it's a Coach Ed topic. And uh, we're going to give it to when will Goudreau be traded? This was asked by Rangers Hockey Fan underscore 31. Uh, so – when will Goudreau be traded, or what's the buzz going on around Goudreau at the moment? Well, I'll introduce it, and then I'll let Coach answer it. Well, so Coach Goudreau, has to talk about Bella Italia, too, a little bit, too. <laughs> and I'll introduce it, and then Coach could do all that. So Goudreau, $3.64 million cap hit, signed for four more years. Uh, we see what's going on around the league. Cap dumps are costing, you know, fifth-round picks, second-round picks. Uh, Rangers – really need some cap space or they're going to be squeezed. So it's being talked about that Goudreau might be a good option. He's a fourth liner making 3.6 million. So um, it's being identified. He might get bought out or traded uh, coach. So with that being said, you can go now. I mean, I was watching an interview with George McPhee, the Vegas uh, uh, general manager, or no president of player of ops or whatever they, his title is president of player ops. And they had to get rid of the guy Riley Smith to make cap space to sign uh, Aiden Hill and uh, Barbashev. 
and he hated to see it happen, but he said it's a business. You know, he helped us so much, but it is what it is. And, you know, it's time to move on. They have to make decisions that they don't like. And it's just a fact. I mean, I would, I'm not going to say I'd be devastated if they, if they have to buy him out or trade him. But unfortunately, when I heard that interview, it makes a lot of sense. Like you were saying last episode, it's a, uh, he's, I don't want to say he's replaceable, but he is kind of replaceable third, fourth liner. They can get another character guy in that could replace him cheaper. His his on ice play is replaceable. It's the uh, intangibles we talked about that are yeah he does bring a little extra with the intangibles, but you can replace his on ice play. And I think sometimes you just got to pl- make it, you know, like McPhee said, like a business. You know, it just is what it is. Uh, we got to cut two million somewhere. I mean, you think about it, if you get if you could dump Goudreau's three point six, you could take that three point six and build a whole fourth line with it. You know, I mean, that's the reality with the market right now. You could sign two guys at one million and another guy at one point six, and you got a fourth line that costs the same amount that he costs. What's so, uh, Jesper Frost's uh, market value right now? I saw him going projected at like two point two, two point three million per year. So, any I mean, we'll chance see. of that happening? I don't think he wants to be here. I mean, remember when he left, he took the deal with Carolina and didn't even give the Rangers a chance to match it. And uh, he said that was the hardest working team he's ever played for the hurricanes. So I don't know. I don't think Faust is like rushing back to the Rangers. I, I think the Rangers might have some interest at the right price, but I think he'll get more elsewhere. To be honest. All right. Yeah. Matt snuck that question in real quick before we move on. That's a Rangers hockey fan underscore 31. Thanks, Matt. So, Goodrow possible buyout being an option. You know, it's an, it's an interesting question. Uh, typically, when fans hear buyout, they're like, no, why would you buy somebody out? You know, you're going to have all this dead cap space on the roster. But Goodrow's buyout is so unique that it makes it an option. So when you, for fans that don't know about cap friendly, you should check out cap friendly because they're really good. They have all the contract information correctly in there. So when you look at Goodrow's buyout this season, if they buy him out, the Rangers actually get a credit of $200,000. So they save his whole cap hit and then an additional $200,000 on the cap for whatever reason. And then next year, a 100,000 credit. It's the whole cap hit saved plus a hundred thousand. And then it's just four more years, 1.15, 3.65, and then down to 1.2, 1.2. So it's really only one season, uh, only one season where it's a, a bad hit on the cap at 3.65. So I think that makes it a possibility from a business perspective. But you'd hate to see the guy bought out. I mean, it, but my, my thing is the way the contract's written for cap credits, it's almost like they knew they might do this. That's what makes me think. You know, the Rangers drafted this contract, right? They negotiated it. It was drafted in a way where if they bought him out after two years, they would get cap credits. That tells me that they had in mind that might be an option in two years. Um, but I don't really see them doing it. I think they would have put. I mean, why would you as? But why would you as a player say, "Oh yeah, that's nice." You know, wouldn't you? Wouldn't that make you feel not good about it? Is he guaranteed that money, all of it? Well, he'll get he'll get paid per the contract. Um, so when you think about it like this, like when over the, a longer the, period of time, yeah. So when the Mets released Robinson Cano and owed him 25 million, Robinson Cano got 25 million dollars. They didn't release him and they're out of the contract. It's not like football. Football, you can cut guys and, and not pay them because that's how the NFL has negotiated their contracts. Baseball's not like that, and hockey's not like that either. So the actual salary owed to Gaudreau would be different than the cap hit. Right. I don't want to confuse you, coach, but every player, their salary doesn't equal their cap hit. It's it's based on a calculation. Right. So like last season, Panarin made twelve point five million. This year he makes eleven. Right. But his salary, his cap hit is the same every season based on the average annual value of the deal. So what really would be that issue for Goudreau is what is he owed on the remaining four years of his deal? So if you look at his deal, he's owed five. 3.75 and 2.5. He'll get that money. It'll just be dished out in a different fashion than, um, well, actually, wait a second, 
5, 3.75, 2.5. So he'll get that actual money, uh, but it'll be different than if he were a member of the team. It'll be paid out per the contract in eight years or two years or whatever they agreed to. Um, but anyway, I don't know. I don't see a buyout happening. I mean, you guys are seeing these trades. You saw Josh Bailey go for nothing. Uh, Islanders had to pay to get rid of his deal. Uh, Riley Smith returned a third round pick. He's a, I think, a, got a lot more value than Goudreau on the market. I would think. I don't know whether Goudreau's even worth anything. Like, what would they even get? You think they trade him for nothing, just to get rid of his contract? Yeah, it's a matter of, I mean, not having to pay anything at all, right? Just dumping his contract. Sounds like the Blackhawks are looking for, for that kind of thing. So, I mean, that would be the only option that I could think of. I mean, isn't there's also he has the modified no move clause. So I don't think he's going to go to a team like Arizona. I mean, the Blackhawks might be a little bit more enticing right now. Yeah, he's got a, a no trade clause modified to 15 teams. So he can block it to 15 teams. You got to think all seven Canadian teams are on there and then eight teams. That's a lot of teams to block. It's half the league. So I don't know. I don't know if they're going to be able to move them. Uh, I don't know if they even want to. Like Coach said, I don't really think Drury's trying to move, wants to move him. Um, but really, other than moving Heedle, Kako, Lafreniere, Keandre, you know, or a bigger, crazier move like asking Trocheck or Truba to wave or trading Igor, like it really isn't a lot of ways to create any cap space. So if they don't move Gaudreau, I think we're looking at a very quiet off season and. We'll see where the young kids develop, but we'll see where it goes. All right. Coach, you raised your hand like you wanted to speak. One other, one other question. What if someone else picks him up? They buy him out, but someone else picks him up. I forget what happened when Shattenkirk did that. They still got to – what happens? They still get the cap hit? Well, you still have to pay for the buyout hit. The buyout's a penalty. So the cap hit is a penalty. It's I'm sorry, not the buyout. The cap hit for the buyout is a penalty for you buying out the player. What you pay the player is based on your contract with that player. So if you owe the player 1.9 million a year and they, they go sign for 900,000, you still owe that player 1.9 million, right? It doesn't get deducted by what they sign with other teams. That's why you see guys who get released. They always sign like minimum contracts elsewhere because they don't really need a big salary they're getting it from the other team so who cares but the cap hit is not affected by that the cap hit is the penalty for the buyout and that's it so it's a good question coach these questions all, right. all again next year all again next year so yeah i'm sure you will <laughs> I'm, you sound really interested while you ask it um all right so we got any more questions yeah, I think we could sneak in one more here. Um, who's going to be the Rangers' backup goalie? And we'll make this one sponsored by Oscar because he's going to have to stitch up a lot of new jerseys because it looks like it's not going to be Halak. Uh, got the news that Halak's going to test the free agent market, right? Yeah, I saw that. Um, so that's a good question. Who asked that question? Uh, another one from Matt. Matt was peppering me today. So another one from Rangers hockey fan underscore 31. Matt asking the good questions. No, I think that's a good question because I can see them going multiple ways here. Uh, coach, you prefer a veteran backup, uh, a younger, but not young, like more project who's got a lot of maybe potential if, if he corrects a few things or like a rookie. How do you like your backups? <laughs> How do you like them, Coach? I would – I would say a guy like Kalak, I would take somebody who's going to be at the end of his career, who's going to have that mental stability. And it's like uh, a guy like a Cam Talbot is what you prefer. Yeah, Cam Talbot or like Kalak was, you know. Yeah, because I think they can go a couple ways. I mean, they could get a Jonathan Quick. They could get a Cam Talbot, a guy who's 35, uh, give him a cheap deal similar to what they gave Halak. Uh, but it's got it's going to have to be for a million or less. 
hopefully less because they don't have space. Um, or they could go for a project like uh, Alex Netoljovic from Carolina and hope Ben Wilder can find, uh, you know, some magic in, in correcting a few things. Who knows? I don't know what they're going to do. No prospects in the NHL? Head. I'm shaking my head. I don't think they should take a chance with an experiment or whatever you just called it. Um, I think they got to go with, I think we called it a backup mentality, right, Coach? I think that's what yeah. you're looking for. Um, so I think a player like Halak is perfect. He must be asking for a little bit too much money, I guess, if he's if he's willing to test the free, free agent market. Um, but I think a player like him is perfect. Like I said, he's returning – to break, not break a record, but set his own personal milestone of 300 wins. So he's going to be hungry. It's not like he's just going to coast and, and you know, ride the coattails of Igor. He's going to want to get in the net and get those wins. So I think it's a perfect backup. Um, and, I mean, I wouldn't hate Jonathan Quick, but I don't really see him signing for less than a million. And I don't really see Cam Talbot signing for less than a million either. Like, couple, like this past year, he was looking uh, – have a great season with Ottawa. I mean, I think he's still – Yep. I think he still has, like, number one aspirations. I don't think he's really looking to be a backup right now, especially not for under a million dollars. The reason why I don't like the experiment situation is if Igor does go down with, a, say, a 10- to 20-game injury, that could be the season if it's if you yeah. have no one. Yeah, we talked a lot about Igor's confidence with having someone reliable behind him. You know, he doesn't feel like he has to play every game. He doesn't have to go out there and win every game. He he has a little bit less pressure on him as well. So, well, I mean, the Pretty Rangers good. do have. Go ahead, Mikey. No, you go ahead. No, nope, you're in. <laughs> I was just gonna bring up uh, Hugo again. I just want Hugo to get his cup of coffee. Hugo's yeah, got to this- sign a contract first. <laughs> six eight goalie with all these six seven defensemen. He's not even signed yet. He's still uh he's still in college, unsigned. But we do have Taylor Boyko, who's six seven, twenty years old in Hartford. So um the you know in the AHL. And what about Garand? Boyko. Yep, I was just gonna say that we got Boyko and Dylan Garand in Hartford. Garand is more highly regarded. Uh, than any of our other goalie prospects. He was on Team Canada at the World Juniors. I mean, he's a really good prospect. Uh, you know, he'll be the backup eventually. So Karan was great in that uh, playoff run, for sure. He yeah, no, he's a stud. Incredible. He's a stud. He's definitely a stud. He's going to be good. So I can see him being the backup as early as next year. So I think a one-year veteran, like you were saying, does make sense. Um but again, I mean, the Rangers have full confidence in Benoit Lair. He's survived like five coaches now, and he remains the goalie coach. So <laughs> there's a there's a reason for that. He's pumped out. You know how many middling backups into star or number one goalies in this league? Auntie Ranta was a cast off in Chicago, gets picked up. Rangers turn him into a starter in Arizona, Carolina playoff runs. Right, Cam Talbot, yeah. another one, um, et cetera. Alexander Georgiev, we can keep going. You know, all these guys who are found in the alleys, the alleys of Bulgaria and pulled to the U.S. and turned (laughs) into a $5 million goalie, you know, so. Do we have any prospects in line for, uh, how was the trainer down in uh, (laughs) Park? Yeah, I know. (laughs) You saw Jim Ramsey sign with Montreal, right? Get out of here. He went to, yeah, Jim Ramsey went to Jeff Gorton in Montreal. Wow. He's joined their sports medicine department. So um, something must have happened with him. I don't know. I don't I know feel why. Like, but, uh, Joe said he was the best in the business. I just assumed it was true. Apparently he's human. You know, I don't know. Apparently he's just human. Yeah. I feel like Montreal is going to become the Rangers like arch nemesis, like just trying to steal all of their players and just weird things going on. Like, Oh, watch Sign out for Alexi. Trainer. Alexi Lafreniere uh, is a restricted free agent. So let's see if he gets offer sheeted by Montreal. That'd be interesting. Um, I don't think Gordon has that in him. But we, but we'll see. So either. 
So I think uh, the big rumor is Jonathan Quick right now. He's from Connecticut. He grew up a Rangers fan. He's over 35. So when a player is over 35 years old, they're eligible for what's called a 35-plus contract. 35-plus um, contracts were added to the CBA because what teams would do when a guy was like 35 years old, they'd sign him to like a seven-year deal. This is when the cap first started. Give him like a seven-year deal at like $1 million a year. Um, and then they would retire right after like a year or two, they just retire. So you end up like keeping the guys hit cap hit down. It makes it look real. And then they just retire mid contract. So to avoid that, they implemented a penalty on one end of it. So if you sign a 35 plus contract and then retire, the team is subject to penalty. Like that, that's also part of the, uh, uh, like Ilya Kovalchuk stuff that was going on, right? So all these penalties when guys would re- retire mid-contract to avoid cap shenanigans, but also they're eligible for bonuses. And that's where the Rangers can manipulate a deal with like a Jonathan Quick or another older goalie like a Cam Talbot. When you're eligible for bonuses, you can push that portion of the cap hit to next year. So they could give Quick or Talbot a deal like 800000 base if they – win 15 games, they get 400,000. If they start 20 games, they get 500,000. So when you start adding up these easily attainable bonuses, it can add up to an extra million to the player and it counts towards next year's cap hit instead of this year's. So that's why I think they may go that route to avoid, um, you know, to not avoid, but to save money on the cap this season and push it down the road, kick the can. Hopefully the cap goes up as expected next year, but, with this league, I wouldn't I wouldn't expect nothing more than a million <laughs> cap increase. So I don't know. Coach, did you follow that? I follow <laughs> it. But, uh, so that's a good question. I think we're gonna see an older goalie. Are we able to sign Coach Ed to a sixty plus contract for next podcast season? <laughs> yeah, you actually get a cap credit. If you sign a sixty plus contract. <laughs> well, all I got to say. If your father was involved with this cap stuff, he'd be going crazy. <laughs> he really would. I could just he hear really- him yelling. If you think I get crazy with it, I could just hear him going, What are you talking about? Just stop. <laughs> yeah, no, he he was uh, annoyed by the cap all the time. He wanted the Rangers to trade for everybody, and I'd just be like, That is a salary cap. <laughs> can't do that. I can't do that anymore, you know. <laughs> that's what they used to do right in the late 90s early 2000s you know yager bure lindros etc it's gretzky <laughs> it's just everybody. they were still able to trade for cash yeah cash considerations were deals i was actually listening to uh, yeah, 32 thoughts yeah. which is elliot friedman's podcast with jeff marrick and jeff marrick is really pushing this theme of uh He's pushing the notion that you should be able to trade cap space. So you should be able to, instead of trading a player, you should be able to be like, I'll give you 3 million in cap space for a second round pick. And like, that's the deal, like period. So then the Coyotes like lose 3 million in cap space. The Rangers gain 3 million in cap space. They didn't have to give up a player, but they just gain 3 million and they lose a pick. I think that's creative huh. and, a, and a decent option. I mean, honestly. it's an asset. It's an asset. So. Well, that's what they're effectively doing, right? They're trading. Well, it's encouraging. It's getting rid of like this bullshit, like buyout, where like they traded Bailey for a pick, and then the Blackhawks bought him out immediately. Like they should, they might as well do the same thing, like you just said, the cap space thing. Still get the pick. You don't have to do this cap circumvention nonsense. And then, yeah. like, and then Coach Ed just said, it's building an asset. Like it's, it's like encouraging the Coyotes to draft more players. And to build the program. Yeah. So the, the knock on it would be like, okay, Bailey's hit is 5 million, right? So that deal essentially boils down to Chicago trades 5 million this season in cap space to the Islanders for a second round pick. So the Islanders just pay for Josh Bailey, right? For this season with that trade, but the, and they keep him. The knock on it is that the salary cap is supposed to create parity. So now you just have guys like, Teams would just be trading for cap space like crazy, giving up draft picks. Like imagine, will, yeah. 
you know, like Tampa Bay just gave up like five picks for one player. Every year they'd be like, give me 10 million cap space. Here's my next first round pick, you know, like. Um, well, that's what the question would be. Like, how many years is that good for just for that that year, that upcoming year? And then you lose that cap space. That'd be a lot of finagling where it's like, what do you do with that cap space after you lose it? Then you're stuck with that player. Then it's going to create even more issues, perhaps. Unless you just, yeah. like you just said, you just keep buying cap space and then keeping the players that you already got. Yeah. I mean, think about it. You might, if you're the Rangers and, and you want to lock up Keandre long term, but you can't do it this season because next year is when the cap goes up. You might make a deal for like five million in cap space right now. Just do it and then lock them up to a long term deal at a good a good cap hit. And then next year you wouldn't need the cap space. But you know, look, it's a, it's an interesting thought. We'll see what the league does. Uh, allegedly, the cap's going up next year to eighty seven five, and then it'll be over ninety two. Allegedly, but we shall see, right? I think so the I think- owners want the cap to be as low as possible because then it keeps the salaries down. Right. But uh, I think that's the, I think that's the issue. Yeah. But it really does squeeze these guys that are on the bubble. That's who it squeezes, squeezes the, you know, Tyler Mott's of the world um, from actually getting a decent contract. Yeah. That's in every league. You know, that's how it works. The big guys in football, the same thing. They don't all make 12 million. They don't all make 50 million a year. It's the, it's the yeah, offensive but... lineman that makes 800,000 a year. They, I did a report on that in college. It's there's guys that the average lifespan's three years. They're not making their, they're not retiring for life on this, on their salary. They move those lower end guys in and out and the big guys, they build around. It's the less yeah. of two weeks. Well, actually, now offensive linemen make a lot of money. So, but your points will take. I'm just saying. It, I'm just that saying. It used to be that way. Yeah. No, I get it. It's it's a tough. It's a business. It is. And the players are just um, assets. You know, they want to fight for more money, and they hurt themselves in a way. We talked about that last year. Yeah, for sure. So while you're waiting for free agency to hit, check out Suter's Sweet Treats. They got some really good cookies to pass the time. I know every night I get a craving uh, for a good cookie. Check them out at SuterSweetTreats.net. They make amazing cookies and they're very thoughtful in how they uh, make them too. It's not just like, here's a cookie, eat it. There's a lot of detail and time that goes into it. Um, I, you know, We get personalized Jeez. notes. I don't think you're all going to get them, but. I, Although I mean, they put a lot of chocolate chip cookies, not a lot of detail in those, but those were pretty damn good. Yeah, I saw Meg kill it with the superhero cake the other day. I don't know if you guys. Yeah, yeah, she's, that. Always, she's always got new things coming out. She also experimented with the uh, rainbow cookie cake. She never heard about that coming down from Tennessee, so she actually put together like a little, like kind of like area of the store with some New York treats. So she's trying to build that up a little bit. Yeah, she said the rainbow cake sold out immediately. So she might have been the only one in Tennessee that that's never heard of a rainbow cake, maybe. But no, I'm just giving her a hard time. But uh, yeah, I hope uh, she's able to keep selling those uh, sweet treats. And I'll keep giving her the ideas. Yeah, I mean, they're really creative. The, you know, you just check out their website. They got the Super Mario cookies, the golf uh, setup with the cake and stuff. It looks like the guy's uh, putting out of, uh, not putting, chipping out of the, the rough on the side with the green grass and all that. So, I mean, they do a really good job. And check them out. While yeah. you're waiting for free agency uh... to hit, Saturday at noon, I think, right? So, I think it's Saturday at noon. I will probably be be driving at that time to much to coach ed's delight so i will not likely be peppering you with uh, text messages i'll be around <laughs> i i think i'll be driving at the time if i drive earlier i will be peppering you with text messages but we'll see um, <laughs> but uh yeah and then we got the fourth of july holiday you know, america's birthday so everybody enjoy that be safe um, we'll, we'll hop on a pod next week if it calls for it. If not, uh, I think we're going to take a week off. Um, but if something happens, you know, we'll find the time, we'll squeeze it in and, uh, you know, give you guys an update on what's going on and what our thoughts are. But if not, if the Rangers are quiet, then, uh, you know, take the week, enjoy 
the Fourth of July, I eat some, you know, grill, go to the beach, whatever it is you guys do. Uh, see some fireworks. I used to go to Coach Ed's house on the Fourth of July. I used to love that. Get the grill going, jump in the pool. It's a good time, but now I'm in Miami, so it's a little difficult. <laughs> A little different celebrations going on down in Miami. Yes, yeah, a little different celebrating the Fourth of July in Miami for sure. <laughs> Actually, uh, it's more like I don't want to say. We might only have Rihanna and Hansel over. That might be my only guest for the barbecue. Oh, they're going away. That's right. Yeah. So you guys are going on a vacation too. So you guys enjoy yeah, that. Me, yeah, me and Mikey will actually suitor sweet treats is supplying the cookies for uh, our baby cousin's uh, first birthday party. Or I should, I should say second cousin, I guess, technically. So put in the order with Suter Sweet Treats, and she's uh, sending us some some mermaid and, like, seashell and, like, un- under-the-sea-themed cookies. So that's where me and Mikey will be next week. So, yeah, if we have an emergency pod, you guys will be stuck with Cousin Ed and Coach Ed arguing with no referee. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, bring, we'll bring on someone, a ref. Um, we'll bring that on, but – Anyway, everyone be safe. Enjoy the holiday and, uh, you know, enjoy free agency weekend. Yep. Absolutely. One Let's go Rangers. Out. Make sure you're taking care of your tattoo with Mad Rabbit Tattoo. Promo code EdPod. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, let's I'm go just Rangers. Over here, boys. <laughs> <laughs> let's go Rangers and, uh, let's go Rangers. yeah, let's, let's see what they do. I'm excited. Sir. Love you guys. Love you guys. Good night, fellas. Good night.